I'm a selfish person by nature. 14 year old Ben, that's when the age of experience came in. Suddenly you get a glimpse of the world and you're like, oh wow, it's not all love, it's not all roses, it's not all happy. I was racially attacked and almost died when I was 14. The first time something physical had happened. Kind of go into estates with my turntables, with my friends and their mics, and we would just go to different estates and just serve for free. Between then, in 2003 to now, I've always just wanted young people to flourish in different ways. You rave on a Saturday night and then it's like, I was church on Sunday. <laughs> the girl I was going out with at the time, she wasn't a Christian, but she had a fascination with church. We went and then we became Christians on that course. I'm telling you, I mind my own business. I'm just getting on with life. And someone says, oh, I see leadership in you. Would you like to do this? Would you like to do that? I'll tell you this, it's always when I'm not ready. I don't think anybody really wants to be an expert in violence affecting young people or vulnerable children or families. The moment I decide to leave church leadership to go full time at this thing, this is where we're at. The biggest challenge of marriage, how much do you work on yourself for the benefit of your marriage and your children as opposed to everything is about my children? Black people are gonna love this and white people are not. George Floyd happened, it is almost like it was a second wave. It was mad, like the book went to number one and at one point was out selling the Bible or the Quran. Why did you go to therapy if you didn't need it? Oh, this is a great question, right? So what happened? Welcome to another episode of Everyday Leadership. And today I have someone who I've been, I've been watching, watching him for years, actually. And this has been a very long time in the making. He runs an, an amazing, powerful organization, um, Power the Fight, which has won numerous amount of awards. And in fact, this year, he's won Charity of the Year for 2023, which is absolutely amazing. Um, and we're just going to delve into the story of, of Ben Lindsay, OBE, you know? <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing, Ben? Oh, man, that's a lovely intro. I'm good, my brother. I'm I'm good, man. And likewise, I've, I've clocked you for a while, man. So this has been a long overdue link up and conversation. Um, but I'm well. I'm blessed. I'm, my family's good. Um, Organisation's in a strong place. We give thanks, you know. We give thanks. So when people introduce you, whether it's the author, whether it's the facilitator, the trainer, the founder... What are the things that you actually want to bring across and what are the main highlights to you when you say, like, who is who is Ben Lindsay? Do you know what? It's really interesting. I'm not... I've never started this work and done this work for accolades and titles. Like, everything I've ever done is for community and, and, and people, right? So sometimes it's like, oh, Ben Lindsay's the author. And I'm like, yeah, that, that's, that's something I've done or... Ben Lindsay, the founder of an organisation. Yeah, I've, I've done that. But ultimately, I I don't know. I'm just somebody who cares, you know. There's there's an empathy which I have, a deep empathy I have for the flourishing of of our community. And my my what I love is just having the opportunity to see people flourishing, whether that's young people or, or brothers or sisters or people in different sectors. I just want to see people flourish. So I don't know. I like... And it also depends what type day of the week I wake up on. So sometimes I feel like an author. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah, no, nah, I'm in the I'm in my writing zone. I feel like an author. And there's other times I'm like, nah, <laughs> my organisations, I've got to deal with certain things. I am I have to be in CEO mode. So, yeah, multifaceted. I, I'm easy. Whatever people want to call me, as long as it's true, <laughs> I, don't, I don't mind. And if I like, even go way back, I'm curious, where does that empathy come from when were you like as a younger 10 year old Ben what was that what was that person like wow 10 year old Ben um I was selfish <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> if I'm being real it was all about me I'm an only child right so therefore um some would argue that only children are spoiled I would argue that um we're well loved <laughs> I love I love that reframing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have to reframe what people feel like. Nah, we were well loved, and uh, because you're well loved, you go up with like like it's all about me and it. I'm the center of the world. I I it's all about. So, ten year old Ben was, um, 
surrounded by love. You know, I had a loving parents. I had um, a loving extended family. So like my grandma was pivotal in my in my life. She lived around the corner for me. So it was kind of like I had the opportunity to literally go two roads away and hang out with my grandma and my uncles and my aunt and stuff. So that was always cool. And like 10 year old Ben had a lot of friends because it was kind of different to nowadays, right? You can knock on people's doors and go out and play football and it was all fun, right? And we knew everybody so in this particular part of South East London where I grew up. It was just, 10 year old Ben was just enjoying life. Um, and that was my experience. You know, William Blake, um, he's got his poems, Age of Innocence and Age of Experience, right? And that was definitely the age of innocence. I was just, everything yeah, was nice. 14 year old Ben, <laughs> that's when the age of experience came in. And that's when everything kind of changed because suddenly you get a glimpse of the world and you're like, oh, wow, it's not all love. It's not all roses. It's not all, it's not all happy. But you know what I mean? I was definitely a kid who was like, yeah, I'm enjoying life. It's all about me. You know, it's that girl. <laughs> well, there's something in particular that happened at 14 year old Ben that you can remember that that caused that shift where you just had to see the world differently. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So I think actually 14 to 15 was probably, yeah, the year years of me being 14 and then hit 15. So when I was 14, I got, um, I was, I was racially attacked um, and almost died um, in when I was 14 um, by uh, a couple of uh, National Front guys um, who are adults and they were men. So that was a moment where it's not like I didn't know about racism, but I, I you know, because you're, you're black and you're growing up in South East London, it's not like stuff wasn't around you, but that was the first time something physical had happened, right? You had the M word phone at you, you know, where we live, we had like bricks thrown through our, our window, we had all that stuff, and that was mad. I'm not, I'm not trying to downplay that. It's like, that was crazy. But for 14, when you almost lose your life to this stuff, you're suddenly like, rah. And then when you're 15 and Stephen Lawrence is murdered and he he was murdered a mile away from my school and some of my good friends knew Stephen and the family and went to church with Stephen, Stephen's family and stuff. That's when you're kind of like, wow, this world is... Now, this is crazy that people actually want to kill black children. It's, it's like, this is, and and as time went on, I realised it wasn't just white National Front people who wanted to kill black children. I, I grew up in a time when we had like the triads and we always seemed, like black kids always seemed to be at the end of, of a madness with the triads. Um, so you had National Front, you had triads. And then it was like, oh, other black children like Ghetto Boys from New Cross or Peckham Boys or 28s from Brixton or, you know, all all these different gangs. Like, oh, no, you also don't really like black people. <laughs> like, it's it's mad. So when I've had time to reflect, I'm like, there was a mad time in the 90s where the black child was some, was a, was a symbolism of, of we want to hurt, we want to maim, we want to kill. And it came from multiple perspectives. Now, I know this is a deep, as a deep answer to your question, but that, that's what I've had time just to reflect as, as I've got older. Yeah, that's what I like. That's, that's the realness. That's the, that's the realness and the rawness. In fact, when you, when you talked about that NF, it took me back to my experience. I remember being a 12-year-old kid having to run from NF, coming back from school. So, so yeah. as I was like, I know yeah. I've been in that environment dealing yeah. with adults trying to navigate. I remember being on my screen from trying to navigate with adults and certain times you ran, certain times you're like, ah, you know what? It's, it's going to be one of those days where we're going to have to fight and you're going to have to fight a, a grown man. But it was just, it was just part of that, that life. And it's, but that's uh, mad, right? That's is. mad though. But if, if what you just said there, you're 12 and I'm 14 and I'm having to fight grown men. Not even people my own, like fair enough. You know, I never really was like somebody who, who had lots of fights at school. But you walk into school thinking, okay, this, if you have an altercation or something, this could end up in a fight, right? You're just like, okay. But the fear of like me having a fight with someone my own age or even a year older um, is nothing in comparison to navigating grown men. 
who not just want to have a fight with you, but they are prepared to go all the way. It it was a wild time. The nineties was like the wild west, man. It, in it, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, crazy. And there's a level of incomprehension that you don't have as a teenager as to why is it there's so much hate? Why is it there's people are after me? And it's only when you get older that you really begin to realize it. So you're dealing with all of that and trying to navigate everything else. And I found it interesting that when I think about how you just described that, I want to call it coming of age and that change in shape in reality. You then went ahead and you always liked English. And you kind of carried that in for a period of time. And it seems to be like a in a sense, a juxtaposition <laughs> of personalities of someone who likes a particular area or particular language or particular focus, as well as dealing with all those different things around growing up in 90s as a young black kid in Southeast London. In terms of writing? Yeah. Or just, yeah, definitely. I I, um, I had a brilliant teacher at school, Miss Bolton, who I still, we, you know, I find older people tend to use Facebook, so so I I'm still connected with her on Flyer Facebook, and uh, so so she's brilliant, and she she was uh, the best English teacher I had because she was just allowed me to just write freely, and we I remember doing books like To Kill a Mockingbird, and and she wasn't afraid to have the honest conversations about race. So it's kind of like, okay, how does what is going on in the streets of Southeast London connect to like the deep South and stuff like that? But she was, just, and you know, it's funny, you know, RIP Benjamin Zephaniah, but I remember when she brought Benjamin Zephaniah to, to our school and I was just like, raw, this is mad. This dread is, is as a poet and a songwriter and a performer and he writes about stuff that we can relate to. And I was reflecting the back with his friends. These are some of the things why I loved English because it was never something which I felt could limit me. So I loved I loved English. It's probably the only subjects I gave 100% to. And, you know, and that showed them. And I went on to university to study English lit as well. So for me, it, it, English was always a way, um, writing was always a way of, um, I'm, the, I'm the type of person who where, if I don't, if I've got a, a concern or an issue or there's something in my mind, I have to write it down. And once I write it down and battle with it, it's good. I'm done. You know, I'm like, okay, it's cool. It's there and get out of my system. So yeah, writing is always a form of escapism, but it's also a form of creating stuff, which maybe I didn't see it was a form of hope. Um, so yeah, I, I always loved, I loved it. I've always loved it, but I didn't, weirdly, I didn't, at that point think, oh, I, I want to write, I want to write. It was just like a way of expressing and going deeper with some things, but it wasn't, I never thought I'd be an author because I had never seen anybody who looked like me. I, I know I just spoke that ben, Benjamin Zephaniah, but I'm talking about people who in my immediate circle, I didn't see. So it never was something which made me think I could do it. Interesting. Do, do you think representation is that important and pivotal because this is a conversation that's been going back and forth recently people are like yeah representation is important and other people are like actually you don't need the representation if you have that desire and dream you become the person that becomes the one that kicks in the door so from your perspective obviously the work that you do as well how do you feel about that i think it's a combination i think representation speeds up the process if i'm honest i i think of course when i think about the amazing pioneers in our in our communities and people we know was there was there any of them before them? Maybe not, you know, in, in some cases. Um, but I always call it the dinner table theory, which is when you think about some of, um, if you take white middle class people and maybe their kids ended up going to private school, whatever it was, right? Um, and let's say they had traditionally two, two parents. And let's say both of those parents worked in jobs which were over, brought in over 50, 60, 70K, whatever, right? The type of conversations that child would have around the dinner table, or even if they're not part of those conversations, what they would hear puts them in a position, a much stronger position to children who didn't. I've seen the confidence. I've seen how they step into things, the, the vocabulary, the understanding about things. You just pick this stuff up. So 
whether they follow in their parents' footsteps or not, they are getting a level of um, intelligence and capital, which they then can then manoeuvre into different spaces and different sectors. So I do think representation is important. So when I look at my own children now, and I can bring them around entrepreneurs and investment bankers and footballers and musicians and faith leaders and politicians, and this is just normal to them. And I say to them, that person does this and this person does that. And it's not, it's not always about money, but it's worth you knowing how much that person's worth. My 11-year-old and my 8-year-old and my 5-year-old, that level of capital they are beginning to understand will set them up in a nice way. Now, does it mean that's all they need? Of course, it's not just about what I show them and what they'll tell them. They've got to have a level of drive and they've got to have a level of intelligence to, to do what they've got to do. But they can't not be inspired by what they're seeing. So I just think it's it's a combination. It's not the be-all and end-all. Um, but I do think we as a community need to try as, as much as we can to put our children, particularly in spaces which we weren't in, to give them that opportunity to just have a wider view of life and the world. Was you wanting to make that change and impact on the younger people why you went into becoming a learning mentor at a primary school? No, the learning mentor thing was interesting because I came out of university and I worked in the city for, for a bit. But it also coincided with me becoming a Christian. And this is the why I said earlier on about me age 10. Probably age 10 to like 21. I was just very selfish and it was all about me. But I cared. I did care about the community, but I'd say probably 10%. Then I become a Christian. And, and, and I kind of... Had this, I had a very clear understanding of what it meant for me and my personal salvation. But what also was a revelation to me was, well, how do we redeem communities? How do we restore communities? How do we serve communities? How do we help communities flourish? Because if this, what I believe in, if I think Jesus has done it for me and this is an ongoing thing which will be happening for me, what does that mean for everybody else? So that was something which was always like a question mark in my mind at 21. So then by the time I I was doing, I became a Christian, I was kind of going to estates with my turntables, with my friends and their mics, and we would just go to different estates and just, just serve for free. And that's where I suddenly was like, no, nah, I want young people to flourish. And then I became a learning mentor because I was like, oh, there's an opportunity to maybe do something different. And the learning mentor thing, again, kind of started this trajectory of my life where between then in 2003 to now, I've always just wanted young people to flourish in different ways. How did you become a Christian? I grew up in a Christian home, um, went to church every week, um, Baptist church in Woolwich and um, in South East London. Uh, deeply religious family. And then, but you know, I, know I, say, I shouldn't say you know, because I, I don't think this is everybody's story, thank, thank God. But you get to kind of 16, 17 <laughs> and you start <laughs> seeing other things. And music was always a big thing for me. I started DJing when I was like 14 and wow. started throwing my, throwing my own raves at 14, 15 and, and stuff like that. And I started getting, I was about to say seduced. It wasn't even seduced. It wasn't even like I wasn't a bad, it wasn't anything bad. It was just me and my friends managing to find venues and, and find parties and stuff like that, right? And I just fell in love with that scene. And then there's a moment when you you rave on a Saturday night and then it's like, oh, it's church on Sunday. Because <laughs> <laughs> you ain't got a choice. <laughs> yeah. And, and there's only so much your mum can like force you to go to church at this point. So I was, I was kind of like, eh. And then I went uni and then I didn't really go to church for three years. Um, I was at uni. And then I came out of university and I wasn't in a really good way. I think I was all university out and I was, you know, I was just not in a great way. So then I ended up doing an alpha course, which is just like a introduction to alpha because the girl I was going out with at the time, she wasn't a Christian, but she, for some weird reason, had a fascination with church. So then she said to me, oh, this is alpha course. We should go. It's all about introduction to church. And I was like, I ain't going to the happy, clappy church. No, I'm all right. And then she was like, oh, I'm going to go. 
Well, actually, what happened was her mum did the course first of all, and her mum wasn't a Christian, and she became a Christian on this course. And I was like, wow, if your mum can go, this is crazy. So I was like, all right. So then we went, and me, her, and another friend of mine, we went, and then we became Christians on that course. And that was 2000, 2000, yeah, it was 2000, and we all got baptised the same day, May the 21st, 2001. You strike me as someone who... When you find something, you go all in. Because I'm listening to you talk about that change you made, you becoming a Christian, you, you start going into different environments, and then obviously it blew up into like part of the fight everything that you're doing right now. But then listen to you also talk about becoming a Christian and you were a pastor for twelve years. What what is it about like when you when you find something you go you seem to just go all in with, <laughs> with everything that you do? It's control. That's a bad stuff. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> I think I'm joking. No, I, do you know what? Again, so many times I find myself like accidentally in situations, and <laughs> so no, I wish I could say I had this major major plan. Like God obviously had a plan, right? But I didn't. I didn't have a plan when I became a Christian in 2000 to become a church leader. That wasn't my, my plan. What was really good, and this is what reputation, I'll go back to reputa- representation point. When you start seeing people around you who are black men who are leaders and you start seeing how they operate with their wives, with, with, with their wives and how they operate with their children and how they operate in church leadership, you start having reference points. So you're like, ah, oh, you know, before becoming a Christian, I hadn't seen too many black men make a success of marriage, right? So then I was like, oh, okay, maybe, maybe this, maybe this can work. You know, um, I hadn't been up close and personal to see how what church leadership looks like. So there's one guy called Owen Hilton who, who baptized me and, and my, my now wife um, and um, married us, and to this day is still a mentor to me, you know? So by the time we get to 2011, 2012, and I'm actually being given the opportunity, well, actually it was 2008, 2009, where I was given the opportunity to help lead a church. And I wasn't there full time. It wasn't until 2012 that I I was there full time. um, And I was a church leader. That, but I could, I had a reference where I was like, yeah, but I see Owen do this. So that's helpful. And I've seen a few others. So, so for me, I didn't really, it wasn't deliberate. And it's always, I'm minding my own business. Most of the time, I'm telling you, I mind my own business. I'm just getting on with life. And someone says, oh, I see leadership in you. I said, would you like to do this? Would you like to do that? And it, I'll tell you this, it's always when I'm not ready. It's always when I think I'm not ready. I'm just like, I'm not ready to, to be a church leader. I'm not ready to, to launch a charity. I'm not ready to write a book. I'm not ready to do a PhD. I, it's always when I'm always like, I feel inadequate to do anything. That's when God says, that's now That's now when I need you to do it. It's not because about you. It's not about you. Yeah. And also, let me let me mould you. So I've been mold, I was moulded into a church mm. leader. I was moulded into, into, into being, I never run a charity before, but I was like, all right, cool. Let's see what we can do. So, yeah, I'll go all in. I'll definitely go all in. What's the point? What's the, what's the biggie lyric? You know, don't don't make moves unless your heart's in it. I think that's what I, I, I genuinely believe that is what has kept me when I'm like, if my heart is not in this, why am I here? Why am I doing it? And if I don't feel, sometimes I hear clearly from God. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's like, this feels right. I don't know. But yeah, man, that's, that's it really. In those moments when someone comes to you and they say, I, I believe in you, Ben, you can, you can do this and you don't necessarily see it. How do you, how have you developed the skill to still listen and to step forward? Because there are a lot of people who will be like, yeah, it's ain't it. And they'll just pull back or they'll run away or they'll feel scared. But you'd be like, no, I've gone all in. In those moments when I don't feel like I'm up to it, I, I go in and, and God molds and shapes me, which is absolutely amazing. But you still need to take the initial step which is what pe- most people don't do. So how is it, what was it that's helped you still take that step in those moments, in those times? I think one of the things that you've got to do is have a very honest and real circle around you. So, of people, that is. So for me, I'm, 
if an opportunity comes, you know, my wife is definitely the first port of call. I'm just like, what do you reckon? <laughs> <laughs> like, I think God's saying this, an opportunity has come here. What do you think? So if we take power to fight, for example, when I said to her, oh, I think I'm going to launch this charity, her first response was, I'm with you because I can definitely see you doing this. But right. yeah. I also need I also need to know that you're prepared to work in Tesco's if this goes all passionate, right? <laughs> <laughs> We've got three children. And, and, I, and I'm like, yeah, I am. But I'm, I think I can pull this off. It's going to require a lot of faith, but I think we can do it. So, and there's other times when there's the other decisions. I can think of some recently where I, I've, I've got a circle of friends around me and I was like, Oh, I'm think. What do you think about this? And they gave me really honest feedback, and they were like, "Oh, well, if you go down this route, um, this could happen. If you go down that route, there's a positive thing." You know, they gave me their honest opinion, and in the end, I decided not to do this particular thing. But it was because I had really good counsel around me, you know. And so I think, you know, what annoys me is when people use the term self-made <laughs> i just think it's the it's the biggest load of rubbish because nobody's self-made wow. nobody everybody had somebody who believed in them everybody was the person some if it's if it's a money thing somebody gave you a loan somebody gave you an opportunity or somebody gave you some advice all the most successful people i know in in, in the world or the people i know around me have got an incredible team around them so this self-made thing, I just think, you're not self-made, don't lie. Because nobody can just be as, like, the top of their game and made it on their own. It's, it's, it, it really frustrates me because we're telling our, ch- our young people a lie. Yeah, man, self-made. I'm a self-made millionaire. You know what? No, what? Nobody is lying. So circle around you is so important. And one thing I'll quickly say is one thing I learned early in church leadership, actually, is to mask your weaknesses. And what I mean by that is if we're, if there's weaknesses in your in your armour, if there's something which you're not very good at in terms of organisationally, bring somebody in who is an expert in that area and that will help you. So there's areas of my organisation where I'm, I'm strong at and there's others I'm not and I will bring in experts and pay the, their salary <laughs> so they can do that job, which I don't have to worry about. These people who try to do all things and be all things to all people, they, they struggle. Know your weaknesses. I know mine very well. So, did you, you, know. did you learn that lesson the easy way or the hard way? Uh, <laughs> definitely the well, definitely the hard way. So, I, I, I remember back in um, when was it? Um, 2004 and I tried I thought I was puffy no I shouldn't say puffy now though should I I thought I was I thought I was another I thought I was another record uh, another, another mogul <laughs> another mogul I can't say I can't say his name <laughs> anymore definitely not him but I was another mogul I thought I was another I thought I was a record mogul and um yeah but I had no idea how to run a record label and I had no idea about taxes and I had no idea I just put everything on a credit card and my idea was like, yeah, when we, when we get signed and when we sign that person, we sign that label and we make that deal, I'll just pay it back. And it never happened. <laughs> so I was like, oh, wow, now I'm in debt. Um, and it's because accountancy and, and tax and that type of stuff is, is never, like maths, like English is my thing, maths isn't. It's, it's kind of, it's never has been. So I there's definitely been a moment where I've realised do you know what? If I'm going to succeed, so when Power the Fight came now, <laughs> the first thing I did was my chair of trustees is an accountant. That is the first thing I did. I said, bro, I need you to be an accountant. Um, I need you to be my chair of trustees because you are an accountant. Um, and that is my biggest weakness in terms of I just don't understand how that stuff works. And that's part of the reason why we're successful because the bits I'm not good at. So I've learned. I've learned the hard way. And I've also learned by... Um, it's not always about the hard way. Sometimes you just observe other people's mistakes. That's the better way of doing it. Yes, that's, that's, that's wisdom. <laughs> that is wisdom. There's a, there's a quote from John Maxwell. I think he said, like, smart people learn from the mistakes of other people who've gone before them. Mm. And Murray's always stayed with me. It's like, actually, that's why I've been, like, speaking to people who are a lot older, people who are just far, way further along than you are. 
you can just tap into that knowledge so you don't have to repeat the same mistakes over and over and over again and and learn some of the difficult things yeah absolutely when you created power of the fire it was on the back of you seeing like two murders happen in a short space of time and was it a case of you thought to yourself when when you said earlier on that you never run charity before but then you've got like this plethora of so much experience working with young people putting policies and programs into place working with local governments so you had such a massive amount of experience so did that give you that confidence to be like actually even though i've never done this before i could do it or was did you just feel brand new to you no it's a great really good question with power to fight so bear in mind i've been in this space now it'd be coming into 24 years next year right so Power Fight's five years old. So by the time we got to that point, it was like I'd had maybe 19 years worth of experience in this space. So I'm always a bit funny about using the term expert because I don't think anybody really wants to be an expert in violence affecting young people or vulnerable children or families. But I knew, I had the knowledge base of what, not only what I think was missing, but also... um who I needed to engage with to make this be a success, right? There was enough on every level. I knew who funders were. I I knew who the trainers were. I knew who the best people to connect with. I'd almost like overthought this without really thinking what we needed. So when we stepped into it, I was like, this will succeed because I just know we have no, um, there is no, it's not about, it's not like being cocky or being um, overconfident. It was more like, I just think everything, so, okay, let's put it this way. There's a need, mm-hmm. right? Young people are losing their lives. Knife crime, gang violence isn't going anywhere. So there's definitely a need. And I think there's a way that we can do this, which can inspire the communities to be part of the solution. People need training. Families need support. Fair piece at work needs to happen in schools. There needs to be a policy engagement with, with um, you know, policymakers, strategic leaders, um, but there needs to be groundwork done on, on a level as well. So I'm thinking of all these things and it was just now being able to to plot it and plot it well. So I, I was always confident that we could do something. What was, what made, what got me sweating a little bit was COVID. Because we launched in 2019 and then 2020 comes, I'm like, wow. The moment I decided to leave church, um, leave church leadership to go full time at this thing. This is where we're at, and that's when you—that's when the faith thing steps in. That's when you've really got to be like, okay, how do we how do we pivot? How do we pivot in this context, right? How do we make sure that we're in a, we're in a really strong position that we don't flop the flop the organization? You know, it 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 was a really scary moment, but we we managed to pivot well enough, and succeed and i'll tell you why how we did it because we were delivering training like this online thing just came at the right time for us we were doing training in person and it was really hard at the first year it was like oh you know let's do the training for free and then you know what it's like you offer free training and 100 people sign up and then two people turn up yeah. i was like this is mad but when covid happened everybody it was a it was a level playing field because everybody was in front of their screens so i was like do you know what? Now our training can go everywhere. And that was just, it was just timing, you know? So yeah, we, it was, um, it was a tricky time, but yeah, we're, it was also an important time in terms of growth. How do you deal with doubt when that hits you around the challenges of, whether it's the challenges around running the charity or whether it's even about, being a man, being a father, being a husband, like there's so much stuff that we can go through that can bring on that doubt. How do you handle that? Prayer, my faith plays a massive part in this, you know. um, So many firsts, you know, I've never been a, I've never been married before. I've never had children before. You know, I've never run an organization before. Or, you know, I've never had, employees before you know it's like all this stuff and it's really um it's really it's really hard particularly when you also haven't 
particularly when you're a pioneer as well. I think when you're pioneering stuff um, and you're kind of like, I don't know if this is actually going to work because there isn't a blueprint for this, the doubt becomes more. So I think one of the things definitely I realised I have to try it as, to the best of my ability always have a balance of spiritual, physical or mental um, sport support or doing something which keeps those three things at an elite level. So spiritually, and it doesn't always work. So sometimes the balance is off, just to be clear. This is not me saying all three of those things are really high. It, it, it shifts. But I work best when, so when I talk about therapeutically or mentally, I've had therapy for the last 10 years. And I started therapy when I didn't even need it. So when these conversations with George Floyd started happening, or even prior to that, when I wrote my book in 2018, when it came out in 2018, I'd already unpacked and navigated a lot of racial trauma. Um, so when it all did happen, I actually found myself in a quite a calm place. So there's the therapeutic side of stuff. And then my faith is always ongoing in my prayer life. If I'm honest, it goes up and down like most people. But the foundations have always has always been there. And then physically, I run like uh, maybe 36K a week and because I, I, I just always want to make sure that physically, and that is probably where I do try and push myself and I run two half marathons a year and all this type of stuff because I just want to make sure that actually in most areas of my life, there's an area of discipline where I'm trying to do something which is discipline. And that really does actually help me deal with the doubt when I'm depressed I know when I'm depressed when I'm depressed it's like I'm not run you know what I mean it sounds like my wife be like I know when you're struggling because there's a pack of biscuits <laughs> why are you eating a whole pack of cookies <laughs> I'm like yeah that's you know in fact I've got to be careful because I've got like milk milk tray <laughs> this, this, this is left to the office and I was like oh <laughs> and, uh, let me just have one and then four later so it's like you know what I mean you want to you wanna know what's going on in my head just check my diet that's that's where it comes down to so the running offsets that but yeah you know we, we and, and the doubt side of stuff it's a real thing and I don't think we talk about it enough but I, I think it's um, important to have the right people around you and, I, and now I've got a good circle where I can just be like I'm not feeling I can be honest I think the good thing about COVID it allowed us to have real honest conversations in a way that we we probably wouldn't have before particularly a lot of like, my male friends you know they were like yeah this is real this is what's going on with my marriage or this is what's going on with with my kids or this is what's going on with work this is we had those types of conversations and it was just honest and I think we've built from that so it's been good why did you go to therapy if you didn't need it at that point in time? Oh, this is a great question, right? So what what happened? When I was working for the Youth Offending Service back in... So I worked for the Lewisham Youth Offending Service between 2006 and 2010. And it was a great time. There's a lot of people who um, I'm still really good friends with. And a lot of people have gone on to do their own organisations from that, from that period of time. It's a very special period of time. And we, there was a young man who lost his life um, called Shackless Townsend. It's a very famous case. It got made into a film. It was it was the Honey Trap murder, um, where he was trapped by a, a young a young girl who herself was being exploited, and led to his death and her incarceration. When we'd all worked with Shackless in different ways, but when Shackless was murdered, for a lot of us, it was the first time that we'd somebody who we'd work closely with had lost their life. And we just remembered thinking at that point, all we had was each other to get us through it. We didn't have any clinical supervision, any therapeutic support, but we had to deal with this level of trauma. By the time I get to like 2010, 2011, I am just burnt out. I'm just like, this is mad. I'm I'm struggling with, with the multiple young people who I've seen incarcerated, um, or had lost their lives. So by the time I get to around 2013, I'm in a church context now. And the thing about when you're a church leader, you are literally dealing with hundreds of pastoral problems. And I said to the rest of the team of pastors, I said, we need some type of clinical supervision. And they all looked at me like, no, <laughs> just read your Bible and pray and worship the Lord. Everything's going to be all right. And I said, I do all that. And I think that is 
absolutely right. But I believe there are experts out there who will help us navigate the level of trauma which we are absorbing on a daily basis with the hundreds of people we are pastoring. So I forced it and I went to um, a Christian therapist at first and she was brilliant. And we just started talking about all types. We started talking about, you know, the pastoral issues I, I was dealing with, but then we started talking about race. And um, again, I went, not because I felt I needed it. I felt I could see, it's almost like I could predict where my life was going. I could predict, predict where my head was going. So let me just do some stuff with her. And that relationship lasted around, I think that was like 2013 to maybe 2020. And then COVID happened. And, and then now I've got somebody else who, who I would say is like a clinical supervisor. But for me, um, I just think particularly black people get therapy, even when you don't need it. Because I think it's like you're, it's a bit like when you run and you're building up your, your oxygen levels or you're doing, you're going gym and you're building up that strength, right? You, you, you never know when you might need to run for that bus <laughs> or, or run for that train or lift somebody out. And you'd be like, oh, thank God I went to the gym last week. Whatever it is, I know it's a silly analogy, but the thing is, it, it's prepared me for stuff which has come. And particularly in this weird space we're in at the moment where the racial racialized triggers that we have to deal with on a daily basis so like, I'm so glad that I've got enough in my armory to, to deal with some of that stuff. I think so. it's a really great point, I think, because naturally, unfortunately, but it's the case with a lot of people, there's a lot that you go through as a black person, in particular, if I should look at just that population alone, navigating stuff we were talking about from like childhood dealing with NS and all that kind of stuff all the way throughout. So there's a lot of trauma, anxiety, fear, just emotional baggage that you generally carry and we get so used to just putting walls up or just shutting it down. And as we get older and older, it starts to seep out. And then you now might become, I don't know, married or a parent and stuff like that. You now to see some of those start to come out because now you're getting new people in your life who are pulling stuff out of you that you didn't even know was there in the first place. So it's always quite good to be able to just actually spend some time on you and working on you and getting all that out. But that's a very great point. What I never want, like my children will have issues because all kids will and maybe they'll go to therapy one day but what I never want it to be is because of me <laughs> like you could be you could have therapy for other issues but not don't ever be don't let it be for your dad or your mum like <laughs> please to the best of our ability let's see if we can maintain our marriage let's keep the foundation strong and let's make sure that we can be in a position where whatever issues you're dealing with you can always come home and know there's a foundation and it's solid there. For that to happen, me and my wife and, and and us as individuals have to keep working on ourselves. This is the thing, right? This is the probably the biggest challenge of marriage. How much do you work on yourself for the benefit of your marriage and your children? Preach. As opposed to everything is about my children. It's such a challenge. It's such a challenge. It's like the chicken and egg. Well, you know, work on yourself. But then sometimes it's guilty. Oh, I've been focused so, so much on myself. But actually, there's a, I think there's an element of get your stuff together. Get yourself and your wife and, and your partner in, in a strong position. And that hopefully will benefit the family structure. So, but it's not an easy balance, right? I'm 100% behind that because that's the foundation. That's the key. And I always say that, um, I use them in both personal and professional contexts, but I say leaders have to be selfish because if you're not, and you don't look after yourself, then you don't benefit or give the best you can to other people around you. Like even when you say an example you gave, like your wife knows when something's wrong, when you start to eat, but you might ask, and she might ask you like, what's going on? You'd be like, yeah, I'm fine. But she can see the evidence that, <laughs> that you're not fine. And it was so the cookie, yeah. the cookie wrappers <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> but that's, that's, the, that's the reality of it. When it's like, actually, yeah, you know yeah. what? I know you're not fine. Not just because what well, you're not eating, but even the way that you're showing up. I need you to be fine so you can give me the best you can and vice versa. And that's how it kind of flows all the way through. So you have to be selfish to, to work on yourself. Yeah, I, I think you do. 
but I think it's it's hard, right? Because there's times when I might do something and I'm like, oh man, I've left my wife with the three kids, right? So it's kind of, it's kind of like, oh. But I think you've just got to, you've, you've got to communicate. That's the one. That's the thing. You've got to communicate. And I, and I think we're both in a, in a strong enough position where we can be honest and just be like, yo, I need, I need some time to work on this. Um, and sometimes it's like the conversation. But I remember times when she went into further education and I, I sat back and I was like, no, you need to do this. And, and you know, I'll support you in what we can do in whatever, whatever way. And then it flips. Uh, now I'm doing further education and it's like, yo, you know, I've got this to do or that to do. So as long as there's the communication, when the tough times come, you just have to remember it and be like, remember we said we were going to do this. And and remember we said this is, a, this is, this is the plan. Someone said to me, actually, this was really pivotal in, in, in our marriage. Like every conversation needs to have five years uh, in advance thinking. So what, are, what decisions are you making now, which is going to impact the next five years? Where do you want to be in five years? And what does that mean for the decisions that you're making now? So that's something which really stayed with me from a young age when, when we first got married, like, well, okay, what, what are the decisions now which is going to impact where I want to be in five years? Where do you want to be in five years? If we're going to have children in five years, what do I need to be doing now? If we're going to be have our ho- first home in fo- or home in five years, what does that mean we need to be doing now? You know, and it, it changes, right? So what I was thinking 20 years ago is different to what I'm now thinking. You know, God, five years time, I'll be 50. It's like, okay, that's a th- 50 is a big number, which I never thought I'd be even talking like this. I'm like, 50? What am I going to be doing when I'm 50? But I'm now having to think that way. I'm like, well, five years from now, I'll be 50. So what plans am I making now? And what does that mean for my children? It's mad. I mean, if I'm honest, being an adult is long. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, <laughs> it's, it's so much to think about. But it's what it's got to be done, right? That's the biggest reality, man. Being an adult is... It's stressful. <laughs> it's a lot. I know when you're young, you're like, I want to grow up. I want to grow up. I want to do it. And then you get to adult, you're like, ah, oh, okay. Maybe those were some good old days when I didn't have to <sighs> worry about so much. <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes what happens is you revert back to that kid. And it's beautiful when you've got children who, who love PlayStation and FIFA because you just, for a moment, you can slip back into your childhood, right? And, and your wife can't say nothing because I'm like, look, I'm engaging with well, my the children. Kids, yeah. well, it's, the, it's the kids. They want... <laughs> They want to play FIFA, so I've just got to apply. <laughs> uh, so it's when they catch you playing it on your own and the kids are not around. That's what really annoys my missus. She's like, it's the most, it's the most unattractive thing watching you play FIFA on your own when I'm sitting right here. Well, I ain't gonna say about that one. So. Yeah, like I said, communications. Honestly, now I got, to, I got to make a decision whether I take that on board or not. You know what I mean? What would you say has been the biggest growth for you? Over the last 20 years? Children definitely changed the game for me. Um, because I'm a selfish person by nature. <laughs> so so by the fact that I now have to think about three other people, like when my first when my first child was born, that was like a what you know, that was a hurricane. I was like, what is this? This is crazy. This kid doesn't sleep. What is going on? Mad tired. Then my second one comes, and she's a piece of cake, honestly. She slept, everything was nice. So I'm like, oh, okay. Then the third one comes. Like, so, uh, so z- zero to one, crazy. One to two, calm. Two to three, that was like a, ah. Oh, I'm outnumbered <laughs> and this is really tiring and nobody wants to babysit three children. <laughs> oh, the car has to be bigger. You know what I mean? Everything just suddenly, everything just changes. Yeah, everything grew. Like nobody told me that three kids meant bigger car, no babysitting, more food. You know, it's all this. So, so suddenly you're, you're having to 
uh, change your, your mindset. Everything I said earlier on about what you work harder for, you have to work really hard now for your marriage and your time and, and, and all this type of stuff. And you go through seasons where it's really tricky. So there was a growth moment. But then also what it means is that everything you do, you do it through the lens of what does this mean for my children? So you write a book and it's like, well, I'm writing a book about faith or, or church and race and my children are going to read this one day what does this really look like? Or you're launching a charity and it's about trying to empower communities that end youth violence. And I'm trying to do it because I also want my children to have be living in peaceful communities, you know? So everything suddenly starts taking on greater significance because it's not an abstract, no-name statistic you're talking about. Actually, if I'm engaging the school system with my training and with my challenge and with my papers and with my reading and with my writing, that's because my children are in the school system as well, you know? So suddenly, whereas before it was like, I just, it's, it's about the flourishing of young people in the communities around me, which is totally still the truth, but it's actually personal now because your children are part of this society that you're trying to help create a more peaceful version of. So the growth, the biggest growth for me was suddenly realizing that, wow, you know, I have an opportunity to shape their futures um, in a, on a micro and a macro level. And that, that's, a, that's a big responsibility. I'm going to say it's a burden, but burden is not a bad thing. Because a lot of times we use burden, we think, oh my gosh, that's, that's a massive waste. I like, know actually it's a, it's a burden to carry, but one that I guess keeps you focused and what it is that you're trying to do and the purpose you're trying to create in the world. And then it has a multiplier effect on so many more people, communities, culture at, at large itself. So it's quite a good good burden to have. It's a burden, it's a reminder. I think there's I think there's just a, a moment where you have to um there's anchors, right? There's anchors where you're just like, oh no, if if you if if you you know, if your ego goes left or, you know, you think about going down this route to have an anchor. Oh, no, no, hold on. My children, my wife, bigger picture. You know what I mean? It's all that type of, you, you got to have these anchors in your life at times, um, which just bring you right back to what it is. Um, so, yeah, definitely. That's probably one of the biggest growths. I think writing a book was also a, 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 a growth moment. <laughs> Because it's mad when you write something. I, it was such a learning curve for me because I was like, black people are going to love this and, and white people are not. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, because the content and subject of the book is very different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not something that's out there. You don't you have people talking about race. Well, race church combining those two elements together and this was before George Floyd oh yeah this is God this is the beautiful thing that was beautiful but I'm so pleased it came out pre-George Floyd for two reasons one nobody could say I jumped on any bandwagon for anything that's number one but also more importantly it was a resource for the church to really help navigate them through George Floyd there was a piece of work here where it was like oh do you know what actually not that it has all the answers, because it doesn't, but it just helps people who never really thought about race, who are church people, and not just church people, pick up a book and be like, oh, what, is, what does Jesus really think about this stuff? Did you, did you get any, any pushback? Yeah, so that's where I was going. So, like, yeah, so that, I thought white people would hate it, black people love it. But what's interesting is that, and this is what I realised, not everything which is black is good, and not everything which is white is bad. And I think that's what we don't want to have that honest conversation about. Like, yeah, of course black people were loving it. And of course some white people didn't. But actually I was really surprised at the amount of black people who struggled. So for example, I was so naive. I just, it's only when I started traveling around the country and doing lots of like, um, like book tours and stuff with it, that I realized there's a real difference between, for example, the Jamaican or Caribbean perspective on this stuff versus the African Caribbean, so African perspective on this. And so there was definitely people who, who in, in those different communities who were like, 
yeah, Ben, I'm with you. And others would be like, nah, what are you talking about? I've got no problem with, with white people touching my hair. And I was like, huh? And actually, Ben, you know, I think, I think you're causing a little bit too much drama. I'm like, what? <laughs> and then you get white people will be like, nah, Ben, this, is, this has been a game changer for me. And this has really got me thinking about some stuff. And I appreciate it. And this has made me think about how I do church differently and all this type of stuff. And or you get the messages where people are like, no, I've, I've had to repent for my madness. And this book has really helped. So you're like, right. So you're getting all these different conflicting. And what it was, I realized what maybe I wasn't aware of or knew how to handle. And I think this works both ways is what I would call contradicting multiple narratives. So I realise people can't really handle that. It's like, oh, so Ben um, writes a book about race and church and is critical of the church's relationship with um, historically with slavery and with with black people, but he's still a Christian. (laughs) It's, It's like, well, yeah, because I don't attach whiteness to Christianity. Mm. And yeah, everyone had a pop. <laughs> everyone had a pop. Everyone everyone had a pop. It was a learning curve, man. Everyone, everyone had a pop. But ultimately, there was like pre George Floyd and post George Floyd. And by the time George Floyd happened, it is almost like it was a second wave. It was mad. Like the book went to number one and at one point was outselling the Bible and the Quran. And I was like, this is mad. This was not what I was anticipating at all. But the timing of God and how this book came about and then when it was really needed. Remember, it's George Floyd, it's COVID, and everyone's got time in their hands. You know? I'm I I it's with a it's a Christian publisher and it's outsold some big boy books and big boy titles and big boy authors because of the timing of it all. Right, so I'm forever thankful. But I think sometimes you've got to go through the fire to get to the the diamonds, and and I'm really thankful for. I'm I'm thankful I went through that, um, because you know social media was brutal as well. You know, Twitter is Twitter's nuts anyway. But I don't think we're designed to hear everybody's opinion. Yeah, no, <laughs> we're, we're, not, we're not built for it. There's no amount of therapy that can get you ready for it. No, I, like, I just don't think God designed us to hear everyone's opinion. And everyone, everyone's got an opinion, right? And it's like, wow. So that was a learning curve. But um, it, it definitely toughened me up. And I was like, okay, now I don't care. Now it's like my Achilles heel is that I wanted everybody to like me. Oh, I'm going to get write this book and everyone's going to be really happy. And yay, Ben. Nah, it, it wasn't like that. And that's okay. That's okay. So it toughened me up. Um. That's definitely a growth moment for me. Um, you need them. You need them. You do. It sounds very much like it was a preparation for what you were about to step into next. I'm sure with Power of the Fight, you've also got a lot of pushback, and a lot of, but you were ready. By the time Power of the Fight came, nobody could tell me anything. I was just like, I know, I know that this narrative is, is created, that this is a black issue, that this is a London issue. And I'm like, I can... We, we're not going to go down that narrative. We know it disproportionately impacts black and brown people in particular in some communities, but this is not a black issue. So with Power of Fight, I've never been more sure of what we needed to do, right? Um, and how we are, we're going to try and affect change. But yeah, people, you know, with our sector, the youth sector, it's no, it's no different to any other sector. There's jealousy, there's, there's people who claim to support you, but don't really want to support you. There's not enough collaboration and partnerships. So when I set up Power of Fire, the first thing I did was try to collaborate as many people as possible. And I, and I, and I paid everybody I work with. And I said, listen, we're going to do this thing differently. And I don't necessarily, it's not about me. If you get shine off the back of the work that you're doing with us, then bully for you. That's great. Um, so we try to do things in, the, in a really nice way, in a right way. Um, and for most of the time, it's, it was, it's been accepted really well. But there's always, there's always stuff where... It's running the charity is no different from running um, a tech organization. There's competitors, right? I never ran the charity like it was a charity. I ran it like a record label. 
That that is it. I was like, so you got you got you got, you got your dream. I got my dream. <laughs> Listen, you made your dream happen without mentioning names. We I, I made I made it happen because I said we're gonna get a big label, we're gonna get a big logo, and it's gonna be roll out. And when we're putting our reports out, and when we're doing our social media, we are gonna run this like a record label. We're gonna get brand support, and and no, and we're gonna be the number one charity in this in this space. We're going to go for it. I was never been so sure. And we've got good marketing people. And we've got people designing stuff. And the website looked nice. We had, we had, um, but it wasn't just all the external stuff. People knew the work we were doing. Our training. Our training's accredited. Like, we were like, we're going to make sure that we are the gold standard for everything we do in this space. And our and our record, um, our, our eva- everything's going to be evaluated. And, and we're going to have reports. It's gold standard. I don't want this... Late this um I keep saying call it a label. I don't want this charity, I don't want this charity to be seen as just another typical charity. And the other thing about it, I'm one of the few black CEOs in this space. So the pressure's even higher because they don't necessarily look at people don't necessarily look at me, or they didn't used to, look at me as somebody who was on par. Are Ben CEO over his little 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 charity called Power to Fight? No. No. Come and check us. Will give any charity a run for their money in that sector, whether you've been there for ten or fifteen years. And, and the more people started seeing that, the more respect that we got. And so it, it's been brilliant. But yeah, it's competitive, and I'm a very competitive person. It's a very competitive. So I was like, we're not playing. We're not playing at all. I ain't gonna lie. This is for me. This is. It feels so energetic listening to you talk about how you approach this because so many times, especially in the charity sector, people are like they come very. I'm sure they need to be at meek. And I'm like, no, it's, you're doing something. You're running an organization with a lot of people who you're responsible for. You need to have the confidence and the boldness and to be like, no, I'm here for a reason. I'm going to make this excellent. I'm going to make the best I can be. And having that attitude and approach, transformational. And your testimony to that. Oh, thank you so much. I just want us to be excellent at what we do. And that means... So we, you know, we have a mixed funding model. We we partner with people. Um, if you got money and our values align, we we can we can work together, right? That's 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 it. And I never wanted to rely on one single fu- like source of money. So that's why we're in a really good position at the moment. Yeah, like we we run chat of the year. That's helped massively. The OBEs helped massively. You know, conversations at least for this year has become easy, right, or easier. But I'll keep saying to my team, this is just for this year. 2024, there'll be another new, there'll be another chat of the year. We won't be flavor of the month, flavor of the year. So we've got to leverage what we've got now, right? So every everything's got to be fire on top, energized, uh, innovation, try new things. Not everything we do works, but you know, we we we're going for it. So I'm I with power to fight, um, we're where we're meant to be. And that doesn't mean it's all easy. Because you're managing people, yeah, <laughs> and people are complicated. But at the heart of it, we know what we're about. We're what we're about and what we're trying to achieve. Love that, and we're coming right up to the end of the conversation. But I want to ask you two questions. One, I want you to fill in the blanks in this statement. Mm. Every black man deserves what? I think I would say actually. Every black man deserves love. And how do you define leadership? Servanthood. Like, I think sometimes people look at leadership as almost in in a dictatorship type of way or they get the hype around it. And it's like, no, if you are called a leader, your first thing is about how you serve the people in your team. And that doesn't, I think when we think serve, I think, I don't know what people's, where their mind goes, right? But if I look at how Jesus served his people and served the disciples, we can go right to the washing of the feet context. It's like, you know, I'm going to wash people's feet to show that I I care um, and what I, I want the best for you. Or, but then Jesus also was the t- type of person who gave it to the man. You know, I think, I don't know what people's versions of Jesus they have. But when I think about the way he was so critical of the Pharisees and the people of the law and the people who were in charge, 
you know, there was a justice issue, social justice issue, which Jesus had. And then when he saw, um, he, when he went into the temple and he saw like the market people in the temple and he started frying tables, there was also a way I'm serving my, my father now because you lot are taking a mick. You're making this a den of inequity and I'm not having it. I'm dashing table. So sometimes as a leader, you just got to know when to serve. And what, what, how do I relate that to me? When I speak truth to power, I'm serving the communities. When I speak, when I, when I, when I make sure that all my team have got clinical supervision, whether you're my EA to my frontline staff, which cost me an extra 50 K a year, I'm serving my team. You know, when I walk alongside the mum or the dad who's lost their child to violence and I have to go to that house and I have to sit down with them and I have to, in the stories I've heard again and again, and sometimes I'm just silent. I just sit with them and if they allow me to, I pray with them. I'm serving the community. Leadership is about serving. I don't care what anybody says. If you think it's anything else, you're not a leader. You're going to be serving somebody and it's, it's painful. It's, it's, it's tiring. You don't get the credit. You don't get the thanks. And every now and again, you get an accolade, right? And you don't know what to do with it because it's so not what you're in for. So the OBE stuff and the chat of the year stuff and the social media of the year leader award I got, I genuinely don't know how to respond to this stuff because it wasn't what I'm about. Now, there are other friends of mine who are in much more powerful situations than me and much wealthier than me. Are like, ben, you need to be more, you know, you need to be more confident. You need to just take it up and you, all this humble stuff. You need to stop this and da, 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 da. And I'm like, I hear you, but that's not me, man. And it's, it's, it's definitely a, there's a juxtaposition of, um, like if I could do this stuff without being known, I would, but I also know for the organization to grow, for the cause to be met, for us to really do everything which we believe God has called us to do, then I also have to use my voice. Honestly, I think that's such a powerful way to actually end this because I think listening to you, you you straddle that line well on that polarity, I call it, of humility and servanthood. And that doesn't mean like we talked about, you're still confident, you're still there, you're still bold, you're still <laughs> running the track like a record label, but you have the boldness and audacity to be like, I'm here to make a difference. I'm, I know what I've been called to do and I'm gonna fully step into it. And that for me is greatness. And when you step fully into your greatness, not thinking about the accolades is when you do get the accolades and you do get the recognition. But then knowing how not to let that become the light that you focus on and mm -hmm. still focus on your core mission is something that you've also done really, really well. You've, I think everyone I know who knows you, one of the words that we use to describe you is humble. And they're like, Ben is like super, like super, whatever he's doing, he's super humble. He's doing a lot, but he's so super humble. And I think that's a testament to who you are. Your organization is a testament to who you are. And it's just great to be able to just further keep on shining that spotlight on the amazing work that Power the Fight is doing, but also the amazing human being that's behind it. Because it's not easy. Like I said, you've got family, you've got kids, you've got so many things that you're carrying on your shoulders. But it's always great to be like, back to the representation piece, they are great role models who are doing the right thing in the right way, and they deserve to have an audience and a spotlight put on them so people can look at them as well. Do you know, brother? Thank you, man. It's uh, that's amazing words which you which you said. It's scary because you know, without trying to get over spiritual, you know the headshots start coming. The more the more you kind of put your head up, so you know it's it's a scary moment because you know when you step into a space where people like even just by association with certain people now, <laughs> you like you just <laughs> get like. <laughs> So the DMs I get, I'm like, this is mad. Like this, this is this is crazy. Like there's me and there's other people. <laughs> there's a, it's, but it's it's very, it's 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 a fine line. And like I will go back to what I've always said. You just got to have really good people around you. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it on this. The one a good friend of mine said to me once, and he's an older guy. Like you said earlier, it's good to have older people in your in your life and stuff. Right? A guy said to me once. And we didn't know each other that long at that point. And he said to me, the thing I'm going to ask you is whether you're teachable or not. And me being a bit younger, I was like, what do you mean teachable? Like, 
But he was like, nah, because if you're teachable, you will always be in a position of humility. If you're always, if you're always teachable, you will always be in a, in a, in a space where you will be questioning stuff and you will question yourself. And, I, and that stayed with me for over 10 years. That Are you teachable? Are you prepared to take this posture of learning? This one, when we talk about cultural sensitivity, we're always like, are you prepared to take this posture of learning where every single moment you interact with somebody, what are you learning from that person? And what can, does that mean for you personally? <clears throat> and that's where I try to sit in this space of humility and sensitivity, which is not always easy when people start gassing you up. But it's like, I've got to be there. Because if I go, if you know yourself and I know myself and I know my weaknesses and I know where I could go, what I don't want is to get to the point where like I'm so gassed and I become not teachable. And my wife and my mum and various other people will cuss me before it gets to that point. Anyway, <laughs> good people. Good people. <laughs> That's good people around It's you. very good people. They won't let me get to that. And when there's been moments where it's like, all right, Ben, mm, careful. I'm like, yeah, no, nah, fair play. But that bit is really important, man. Are you teachable? So, yeah, I pray everybody remains teachable who listens to this. How can people find out more about you and support the work that you're doing? Ah, first of all, you can go to our website, www.powerthefight.org.uk. You can follow us on all the socials, which is just Power to Fight UK. Um, if you want to see my personal Instagram, which is mainly just me running a lot, <laughs> which is not that interesting. <laughs> that's just BCW Lindsay on all the socials but somebody said to me the other day like, Ben you just make me sick every morning you're just running da, 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 da. I, I, I was like well, don't follow me then <laughs> is that simple isn't it you know like yeah. it go somewhere don't, else right? don't follow me yeah, I did, like I'm putting like abuse and stuff on my page and just me running and that's upsetting you you mad so I was like don't follow me then yeah, so, yeah. If, you, if you want to be annoyed with me running early in the morning follow me this is Everyday Leadership Catch you next time.